Hello, everyone, and welcome to Biohackers Lab. I'm your host, Gary Kerwin, and on today's episode, I have Dr. Brianna Stubbs. Brianna's been on the uh, show before talking about ketone esters, and I've got her on again to continue that talk. Thanks so much for coming on, Brianna. It's a pleasure to be on again. Thank you very much for inviting me. No problems. Uh, so you're, um, just so if people are listening, you're traveling at the moment and you're back in the UK because you live in the States now, don't you? Yeah. So in June, I took a job with Human, the Human Enhancement Company, and they're based in San Francisco. So unfortunately, I had to trade in the gray skies of Oxford for the beautiful, brilliant blue of California. And it's been a, it's been a hard six months, I've got to say, with all, all that sun out California. But so I work full time with human. I'm the research lead. And uh, just a few months ago, we launched the first world's first ketone ester, human ketone. And it's now available to, to buy on our website. So I've been part of the team bringing ketone esters to the world, which has been fantastically exciting. Yeah, and that's exactly why I got you on because uh, last time we spoke that you hadn't moved across to San Francisco and this and the ester wasn't commercially available to the public. And now it is. And that's exciting. Yeah, and I've had a couple of publications. It's been a great, a great six months. Yeah, so so maybe if you could then just update us uh, on those two publications that you've uh, you've produced since uh, we last spoke. So I think last time we spoke a little bit about different being ketone esters and ketone salts, as that was one big area of focus in my PhD. And so I published a paper in Frontiers in Physiology that was uh, sum a summary of a couple of chapters of my PhD thesis. And it was looking at how um, ketone esters and how ketone salts um, can be used and taken to raise blood ketone levels. And so that was published in Frontiers in Physiology and um, lots of positive response there and a lot of interesting discussion, especially around how the body can use uh, L-beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is... Um, which is the like non-physiologic isoform of ketones. Uh, yeah, so that was my first publication. And the second was uh, published in Obesity, and that was looking at the effects of ketone esters on appetite and on ghrelin. Uh, that, again, showed that ketone esters uh, decrease appetite and decrease ghrelin. So there's a possibility of using ketone drinks as sort of an appetite suppressant. But it's interesting because ketone drinks allow us to isolate the effects of ketosis, uh, on different signaling pathways from the effects of the ketogenic diet. So a lot of people who follow the ketogenic diet, they say that they feel less hungry. And it may be that that's because of ketones. And so that's what I discuss in that second publication. So is that the first time in, in a publication that, that you've been able to show that effect? Well, so there was one meta-analysis that looked at the ketogenic diet. Um, and appetite and they found uh, across all of the different studies that have been done using a ketogenic diet that ketosis was associated with suppressed appetite but this was the first time that it had been shown with exogenous ketones and um, that giving exogenous ketones and having ketones in the body was uh, affecting appetite and affecting gut hormone secretion. Okay fantastic so just um, a point I don't think we touched on last time that pe some people who are listening to my ask is about raspberry ketones because we, we didn't i don't think we brought that up last time is that that's, no, that's, that's because, completely that's different it's isn't so it? dissimilar yeah so i mean when we talk about chemistry a ketone just means a carbon double bonded to an oxygen so it's it's quite a non-specific term but when we talk about biochemistry and when we talk about the human body ketone is a very specific term and it refers to beta hydroxybutyrate acetoacetate and acetone so there are plenty of other molecules out there in the world that have ketone chemical groups um, and are chemically classified as ketones but they're not biological ketones in the same way that beta hydroxybutyrate acetate acetone and acetoacetate are so um, raspberry ketones do have this c double bond o so they have are chemically a ketone but they're not anything like what's produced in the body they've actually got um, a carbon ring in there they're very different structurally and they can't be used as an oxidative fuel source so um, where people tend to get confused is because raspberry ketones in in some very um, specific cell experiments have been shown to speed up fat release and so because the ketogenic diet is associated with increased fat release people are kind of again conflating the two together um, conflating raspberry ketones with the ketones that are produced by the body in the ketogenic diet, when in reality, raspberry ketone is a sort of a, a naturally occurring, but in the supplements, it's a synthetic compound that we can ingest that's not being used as a fuel and it's not having its signaling effects in the same way that physiological ketones are. So they're very, very different. Okay, well, that's a good thing to know because, uh, yeah, I, as a consumer, I might see just the word ketone on a supplement and think, oh, no, it's going to it's the same as what we're talking about here, but I think that's is a good point for people to know 
what you're talking about, the esters and uh, particularly the one that you've worked on, it works biologically in the body in a very different way. Yeah, it's really important. Uh, and thanks very much for bringing that up. I think uh, it's important to say really that the evidence that raspberry ketones do anything in humans is non-existent. Um, there's been some sad work and some animal work but even with animal work, there's no indication that you could give it to humans in a big enough dose that would meaningfully really have an effect. So it's um, I wouldn't I wouldn't advise putting money on raspberry ketones at this stage. It's still still a bit of work to be done. There. Okay. Especially weight loss. Um. So I'd like to get then into your um. In, the company's called Human, even though it's it's spelled H V M N. H H V M N. HBMN, it's, it's edgy and exciting and also four letters so that when we go public, it fits in the stock exchange ticker nicely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with this, this Esther, it's anyone can buy it now. It's, it's, it's in the public domain, right? Yes, yeah, so it's available for pre-order and it'll be shipping early 2018. Okay, so it's not so to get your hand on a bottle right now, you'd have it's just pre-order. You can't actually get your hand yeah. on a bottle. Yeah, if you... If you put your name down now, you'll have your hands on the bottle, your bottle on the bottle before anyone else. But and that will be twenty eighteen. Okay, all right. And I was interested to see because um, last time when we spoke, we were getting into the athletic side of ketones. So this is our opportunity now that you can reveal the information around um, performance and other aspects of why an, an athlete or someone who's sporty wants to would want to look at a ketone ester. So I, I yeah. the so one I mean, that, yeah the one that sorry you know, the one that really got me I think maybe if we start um, with that was just seeing how you could actually mix a ketone ester with carbs for athletic performance. Yeah, I'm really pleased that that's what you want to start talking about because that's where I was going to go first. So up okay. until now, people have been interested in ketosis performance, but the only way to get ketosis was diet so what having a ketone ester means is that you you take it along with carbohydrates in a normal diet and your body has another fuel added to its palate of fuels that it can burn so you, your body can burn ketones your body has also got full carbohydrate stores and your body can burn fat as well and it's really mixing the ketones with the carbohydrates that gives this synergistic effect and boosts performance so when you have a ketone drink before you start to exercise your body starts and some of the ketone instead of carbohydrate. And so we saw uh, in some of our work in Oxford, the ketones are accounting for maybe between 16 to 20% of the energy at a fixed work, uh, the carbon dioxide expired to be, to be exact um, at a fixed workload. So it means the body is using ketones as an energy source and that's relieving the need to burn carbs. Uh, other indicators that carbs aren't being burned as, as much during exercise is that the lactic acid levels in the blood were consistently much lower with ketone drinks compared with you didn't have ketones before exercise and we also did some pretty fun work and looked to see actually how much glycogen was in the muscle um, and there was much less glycogen used when you had a ketone drink before exercise compared with not so uh, what we how we think one of the key ways we get ketones are having a performance is by sparing carbohydrates so that later on in the bout of exercise when you've used all the ketones you've still got all of this carbohydrate left over and it means that you've got a second gear to really step on later on in the performance and that's very consistent with a lot of the uh, anecdotal reports we've had from athletes who have used this they really say that in the third quarter of a match or as they're coming into the point in a, in a cycling or a rowing test where they'd be really hurting that they can actually push on and exceed what they would normally expect to be able to produce in that in that last part of the test. Okay, so that's fascinating. So in, I'm just, the way I'm listening to this is that the body is going to prefer burning using the ketones for the energy in the first part, and then you've you've got a bank of energy which would be what the carbohydrates and the glycogen would be used for later on in in your in your activity. Yeah, I mean you're pretty much correct. I think it's interesting to use the word preferred because it almost infers that. Um, our body is like picking and choosing what it wants to use and when and in reality metabolism it's never on or off so you're definitely still using carbohydrate um, early on when you have ketones you know, ke like i said ketones are only accounting for 15 to 20 percent of the energy output there so there is still some carbs burning it's just it's sparing it's leaving the pressure on carbohydrates i wouldn't necessarily say that ketones are displacing or you know ousting carbohydrate that's still that's still being used and still being burnt but it does mean that you have more left later on mm -hmm. okay and um 
Do you think then there's a difference between endurance sports and power sports like sprinting or weightlifting? Yeah, for sure. So we we know that the ketone works better for the endurance performance because we've seen we've seen with some sprinters that there's going to be very little effect of taking ketones on a say a 10 second sprint performance because that's very reliant on carbohydrate metabolism and at that intensity ketones aren't aren't burnt because some, a lot of that happens through anaerobic glycolysis and producing lactate. So you still need to do that to to produce energy fast to sprint. It'd be interesting to work out what happens to the even faster release energy from the phosphocreatine system. I don't I suspect that ketones won't have any effect on that as well. But it's when you start getting into aerobic respiration and um, long endurance uh, sports, that's when ketones are most likely to be beneficial. Okay. So for performance anyway, but um, just to say quickly, we definitely are really excited to see um, future research and based on the current research we think ketones are going to be very useful for recovery as well so um there's mm. a couple of papers that have been published looking at glycogen resynthesis and protein synthesis and some work in animals and in cells that looks at the effects of ketones on inflammation and so i think that um athletes will really benefit from adding ketones uh pro- protocols as well okay so so um that's maybe where your sprint athletes or your powerlifting athletes could benefit from a ketone by not taking it before an event because the body's not going to use those ketones for the energy then, but actually after the event so that they speed up their recovery. Yes. So if, especially um, if you're doing multiple efforts over a day, not necessarily going to benefit your performance if you're a sprinter using it beforehand, but if you've got to get ready to go again, taking ketones is going to be very useful. Yeah, I'm just thinking then, so if, if an athlete was at a meet and they were a 100 meter and a 200 meter sprinter, so there's, there's a lag between the two events, potentially they could take the ketone ester in between those two events? Yeah, definitely. If there was enough of a time interval between, I think it would be useful. But um, I, I think there's more research that needs to be done before we can give you like a really clear answer about that. Okay. And then, but... Even there, if say if we we go we'll go away from athletes and more just the general person who's going to gym and weightlifting maybe training, would do you think there would be benefit taking a ketone ester after they've done their gym training for the day their weightlifting? Well, often these people are looking to optimize their body composition, and this is where the um, appetite control kind of aspect kind of maybe comes in, right? So if you're um, a gym gym going like three times a week you want to do your weights and then you want to have some carbs and protein after that to build muscle to promote muscle building so if you want to build muscle you need to be in calorie excess first off you know an appropriate amount of calorie excess then you also need to be doing resistance training that's also important as well um and so it's calorie excess resistance training and and adequate protein so if you add ketones to that I would expect there to be an enhanced effect of also doing those three things because ketones activate mTOR signaling in the muscle. So they're going to promote uh, lean muscle synthesis. And we've seen uh, people on the ketogenic diet anyway, having favorable effects on body composition. So losing more fat mass and maintaining lean mass while following a ketogenic diet. Okay. So yeah, um, because I, I had uh, Professor Stuart Phillips on, and we were talking about some the problem with some ketogenic diets. Uh, well, people on a ketogenic diet is that they don't eat enough protein and they lose lean muscle mass. That was his concern. Yeah, I mean, you think people uh, who are following a ketogenic diet are often afraid of protein because they're afraid of eating too much and triggering gluconeogenesis um, from from protein. So I think it's very difficult to follow a, a well formulated ketogenic diet. I think it takes a bit of personal experimentation to get it right. Yeah, and th- this is this comes back to what we talked about earlier about taking carbs and the the ketone is that it's sort of it's fascinating where I can imagine someone on a ketogenic diet um, just wondering, yeah, so can I up my carb intake for athletic performance reasons and still and still maintain good good weight control um, by taking a ketone ester like yours? Yeah, I mean, it certainly depends on what type of carbs you're eating, right? Because um, taking ketone esters doesn't inhibit uh, insulin secretion. Uh, so you're still going to be getting an insulin spike if you eat like a very uh, refined carbohydrate rich meal. So if you eat a cookie or drink a, a bowl of orange juice, you're 
still going to get an in- spike. Um, but if you were to eat slower release carbohydrates, uh, whole grain, sweet potatoes, and things like that, then then perhaps that would that would still give you good weight control, taking ketone esters on top. Okay. Comparable to if you were following a lower carb diet. Yeah. So, so uh, it would give you the uh, possibility that you could add in non-refined carbohydrates and still get weight control. I mean, it's interesting. I think I'd like to see more research done on that before before I gave you like a fixed opinion on it. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just thinking here. Uh, already, people that would be interested in taking the ketone ester, uh, we, we have our we have the group who are the athletics group, but I also just think of the general lay person and how they can try gain benefit or know how to use the ester to their best ability um so yeah weight weight control would be the one well i think it's very interesting if people are trying to adjust to a ketogenic more ketogenic diet so if people are trying to lower their carbohydrate intake and they're getting keto flu symptoms or they're getting headaches or nausea or things like that then taking exogenous ketones is a way to provide the brain with fuel so you don't get those symptoms of hypoglycemia without having to take on carbohydrate which up until now would have been the only way to make yourself feel better other than just pushing through because you can't necessarily um speed up your body's production of ketones especially if you're not used if you're not very metabolically flexible and used to switching between those fuel sources i think it seems to be anecdotally that if you fast often or are used to a ketogenic diet it takes you less time to get back into ketosis but for people starting off for the first time two or three days in or four days in they can hit this real row bump and they get nasty symptoms of um, keto flu and i think taking exogenous ketones around about that kind of transition point could be could be very interesting um, and for people, so for people who are looking to avoid keto flu, or maybe if they're doing um, a long fast and they're really struggling and they don't want to kick their bodies out of ketosis per se by taking on fuel and carbohydrate, they could have keto exogenous ketones. But again, some purists, fasting purists, say that any calories are breaking the fast, and the ketone ester does contain calories. So I mean, I don't want to be on record as saying that use ketone esters and it doesn't break a fast i would just say using ketone esters won't completely derail the metabolic effects of fasting in the same way that having an insulin spike and eating carbs would so it's, it's a lot of work still to be done there a lot of the work as you said is focused in on athletics and so all these other um uses for the general public and also clinical uses as well need to be explored a little bit further yeah yeah but um but I like that idea already if someone's wanting to uh, experiment, do a little N equals one on themselves, that um, taking a ketone ester could help them through that transition stage, um, which either is if they're doing it through a dietary wise, uh, even uh, a higher fat diet, or if they're actually fasting. I hadn't even thought about um, yeah. that same issue when you're fasting and you get the, the keto flu kind of symptoms or the yeah you, you don't feel great when you're initially fasting sometimes. Yeah, I mean, a lot about fasting is um, confidence and mental, uh, the knowledge that you can fast for that long. So, I mean, I remember the first time that I did 36 hours and you just don't know that how you're going to feel after that long. But if you knew that you could um, have something that would make you perhaps feel a little bit better, then next for 36 hours, maybe you wouldn't need to take the keto nester, but in order to fast for that long. A lot of people, we have a group, uh, linked to human called we fast or it's an intermittent fasting community and a lot of people are looking for um i'm i'm gonna say crutches but i don't don't know whether that's the right word but to help them push through that really difficult point of fasting and maybe human ketone and exogenous ketones would be a really useful useful thing for these people maybe we should call it a transitional supplement for some people yeah so. yeah sure i think um we're a little way off knowing how best to advise people to take it day to day but certainly kind of uh, more acute uses for athletes and for people maybe looking as you said looking to transition then it is i think it's got uh you know i'm pretty confident that it will work for that. okay and then I, i'm so sort of, um, just thinking if someone's going to take it pre-workout and then take it post-workout for recovery reasons um could you take too much ketone ester um in a day too so we're we're advising that people don't take more than three in a day. Um, and in my PhD, I studied three drinks spaced by three hours apart. And the good thing about exogenous ketones in comparison with um, diabetic ketoacidosis is that the body is still able to burn ketones um, at a rate. That's, so when you pour ketones into your body with a drink, you pour them in and there's a fixed amount in your body and it goes up and then your body uses it and it goes down. Whereas in diabetic ketoacidosis, the body isn't using ketones 
are greater than the rate that, that they're being produced in the body. So that's why they build up to a harmful level. So even if you raised your levels too high with human ketone, your body should still be capable of burning the ketones. And in time, the ketone levels will go down because there's not, if you use the analogy of a bathtub, the tap isn't on as well as with diabetic ketoacidosis, the taps on and the bath's overflowing. So this would just be the equivalent of maybe overfilling the bath. There's a bit of overflow, but then in time it's going to drain out through the plug because you're burning it. Um, so people could raise their levels too high if they had too many drinks of human ketone. And that's why we're saying only three drinks in a day. Um, what would happen then is that the amount of ketones in the blood would lead the pH of the blood to drop and it would be ketoacidosis. It would be a mild ketoacidosis. But as we, I said that a second ago, your body would use the ketones as a fuel and they would be kind of cleared in a, in a short interval of time within a few hours rather than it turning into a spiraling medical condition. Mm. Do you think anyone would need to watch out for any particular symptoms in that situation? Like any warning signs that they, they've, gone to, they've taken too much? Well, if people are measuring their blood ketones, that would be like one more indicator. So the, we are kind of targeting people to get between three to five millimolar. Mm -hmm. um, and the Abbott handheld readers, they read up to eight. So if you're going over eight, uh, on an Abbott reader and no longer able to see how high your ketones are going because over eight, the meter just says high. So if you're seeing that, then don't drink another one for goodness sake. Um, but I do think in order to get to a level that would be at all, at all worrisome, so 15 to 20 millimolar, you really would have to drink four or five or six drinks. And I, so I don't think that that's, I think that people should be more sensible on that, let's just say. Yeah, hopefully. The warning signs of diabetic ketoacidosis are heavy breathing and a sense of dizziness, uh, nausea. You don't feel great. You'd, you'd know if you were going into ketoacidosis. But as I said, again, it's the body's going to rectify that. The body's going to buffer the ketones. The level's going to go down as you metabolize it. So it shouldn't be um, something that, uh, that you notice and is then going to get worse. It should be something that you notice and then the body burns through it and, and goes away. Mm -hmm. So, but don't take more than three in a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please don't. Uh, so, I'd love to know because um, you've 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 taken it. What does it actually feel like when you when you drink it? Do you do you feel anything? It depends. Uh, uh, like some people do feel something. I I do. Uh, I feel like I'm kind of more behind my eyeballs. I feel like I have. Um, a well of energy inside me and I look kind of look at a wall and I'm like, oh, I feel like I kind of like run up that wall. But I don't feel the kind of jittery energy where you're like, oh my gosh, I want to run up that wall. You just feel um, switched on and focused and energized. And I know other people that feel like that as well. So it's an objective feeling of uh, energy and focus. But then there are some people who take it and don't feel anything. So, I mean, I don't want to like overly prime people as to what to expect. Yeah. So it's because I think um, some people might use it for the brain and possible brain enhancement effect too. So they so they're thinking, yes. is it like a nootropic effect where I take a, a brain supplement and suddenly I get this wow, I feel switched on effect. Um, but as you said, some, may, some people yeah, some might, pe some people might might not. Yeah, some people um, describe it a little bit like uh, the Bradley Cooper film Limitless, that feeling of kind of uh, clarity and your brain being able to do kind of things over and above what it would normally do. Um, and then we've given it to some people and they just feel anything. So uh, we have got some data in animals that suggests that it improves cognition. So we did um, a seven day trial where rats were fed the ketone ester and each day they had to solve the maze and they solved the maze about 33% faster, so a lot faster, about a third faster when they were given the ketone each day. It's like pretty promising that there's a cognitive effect and there's some early evidence from rugby players and also from a cycling trial that we ran at Oxford that looks like some markers of cognition are improved. But measuring cognition in humans is really, really difficult. Um, people's mood, people's tiredness, many uh, tend all of these things uh, affect cognitive uh, testing results. So quite difficult to pick up a signal in all of the noise. Um, so I, again, I think this is something where try it and do your own end of one experiments. And we actually had someone using our ketone ester, human ketone, and doing brain training. So he took, uh, he did brain training for a few weeks until his scores had kind of plateaued. So he was trying to eliminate a learning effect. And then he took the, the ketone ester and um, he, he did much better on the brain training. Uh, so I think I think that's pretty encouraging evidence that will work for some people, but 
yet to be borne out in uh, scientific research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, there was another biohacker, Bob Troyer, who found the same thing taking a keto nester. So it's, oh, it looks like it. it's, getting, it's getting good. I think that's the one I was referring to. I think Bob Troyer was using the same keto, same keto nester that is inside you. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I'm also thinking now um, you might get some people who would want to take it for the long term. Would taking a ketone ester regularly every day, just one a day, um, do you think that would be a safe thing to do? Or would you need to cycle off it for a period of time? Um, you can be on the ketogenic diet for many years and not have any ill effects. I think um, we're starting from a point where we assume that it's safe, but would like to see um, research studies done to kind of confirm that. Um, it's a human ketone is a food, and the FDA has approved it as generally recognised as safe. So that means that they're very happy with the safety profile of all, and all of the data that we've shown them up until this point. So I'm confident that it's safe, but at this stage, um, and we do. Have so in the future, people will replace some of the refined calories from refined carbohydrate with calories from ketones. We kind of see ketones and ketone acids and keto, exogenous ketones as a fourth food group almost, like a new macronutrient. So um, maybe in, in the long run, yes, people will be taking and using ketones as part of their day-to-day -day, uh, routine. But I would like to see more science studies done to, so we can really understand what it's doing inside the body before, before really having that as like an or out and out of opinion and recommendation. Mm. Yeah, because I, I think I think at this point mm -hmm. the price Sorry. is limiting, so people aren't uh, because at the moment it's still relatively expensive. It's a bottle. So I hope people. Well, I don't think there are many people that have got the money to be using that three times a day every day at this stage. But we're planning to scale, and the cost will come down. And then, as you say, people might decide to do that. So it'll be interesting if we can, if the reset can keep pace with the uh, commercial product like product productization aspects. Yeah, because do you know of any sporting teams then that, that have uh, been using this for a season or a couple of seasons? No one's been using it for that long. So since we launched Human Ketone, we have had some professional teams in different sports using it. Um, and also during my time at Oxford, we worked with some professional teams as well. But um, up until now, um, it's been availability that's limited this research. Um, so it needs to be done. It needs to be done formally um, before we can really come to any official recommendation about long-term use. But I mean, I th uh, long-term, from looking at my looking at research done in sports science just generally and um, whether it's training and nutrition it, we are coming to a point where we recognize that we have to periodize training to get maximal adaptation and there's also benefit to be had by periodizing your nutrition to match the training you know training sometimes in a fasted state sometimes training in a um, carb replete state and sometimes training depleted and Thing and, and you know making sure that you optimize your protein intake when you're doing a heavy lifting block things like that um are so becoming more sophisticated our understanding of how to new, use nutrition and how to use training in much the same way with training you'll have um, summer racing periods say where you're doing a lot more lactate threshold work and sprint intensity and over the winter perhaps when you're not competing you're building endurance and so training uh changes according to to the demand and according to the time of the season and nutrition should be the same and so i think um keto nesters like maybe as you were kind of hinting at yourself there would be something that teams would use in certain cycles and certain training blocks and not necessarily something that they're going to be using all of the time um using it cyclically to really maximize the adaptation so are we going to see this in uh, the boat race do you think uh, oxford and cambridge are going to use this well, I mean, it would be lovely to see them using it, given that it was developed at Oxford. Um, yeah, I think it would be great to see it. It's a perfect uh, sort of length for it as well as so a 20-minute race. I think it would be very, very interesting to have them use it. But um, they they have a limited budget and they have a lot of things to pay for. So we'll see whether whether we partner up with them, whether they can afford it or whether we can make some available sponsorship. But I'd love to work with them. Yeah, that would be fascinating because, I mean, you can't, being a, a world champion rower yourself, I'm just thinking – you probably would have ideas of how rowers could implement using a ketone ester. 
Yeah, I mean, when I look back at my time on the team, I wish that I'd had it around about this time of year when your volume of training goes up quite a lot just after Christmas. And then as a lightweight rower, I'd have to start losing weight ready for the summer competition in January. So it was always awful. You kind of go away for Christmas and there's some nice food and you have a few days off and then you come back and you have to start cutting weight and start doing even more training than you were doing beforehand. So it was always a tough time of year and very easy to get sick. And so I think um, having something like the keto nester where you would probably you would feel better recovery, you would have uh, better fueling for your long endurance sessions. And then maybe also the added bonus of appetite suppression, uh, preservation of lean muscle mass and appetite suppression around about this time of year where you're trying to cut weight. I think it would have been really useful. So I think um, especially for lightweight athletes where every calorie really matters, having some calories come in as ketones because of all the beneficial signaling effects of having ketones. I think that would be a really valuable addition to, to rowing training. And uh, I'm also thinking probably to, uh, well, uh, another popular sport would be runners, endurance runners, like a half marathon and marathon runners. Yeah. Um, and they train chronically too. You know, they, they train all the time. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just wondering there too. So they could take it um, 30 minutes before uh, race day. Yes, exactly. I and mean, we'll be really, really excited. And kind of what really captured my imagination when I joined Human was the opportunity to try and reach out and work with people trying to break the two hour marathon because they got so close recently. It was two hours and 24 seconds, I think. Mm. And so when you're talking about that smaller uh, percentage, fueling uh with ketones could potentially give you that little extra advantage so i'd be i'd love a chance to work with some elite runners and and see see what adding ketones to their regime could do and of course because the ketone ester is uh water approved so it's yes. not not a banned substance so um olympic athletes can take this yeah so it's not currently on the water prohibited list because it's just like a, a food stuff really it's like athletes carb load athletes use caffeine whether that's in coffee or whether that's in a gel um, athletes use protein powders and protein shakes athletes use nitrates which is like a vasodilator so there's lots of uh, things that are in an athlete's nutritional toolkit and ketones are just one of those things and as you say water compliant and also human ketone is going to be batch tested by the nsf which is the american equivalent of informed sports so it means that um, someone independent is going to look in it for any banned substances and be able to certify that it's it's safe for athletes to take okay Another application, or just off the top of my head, I think could be very useful for this for two benefits would be um, boxers or even MMA fighters because yes. they, um, especially boxers, when they might go through multiple rounds and they fatigue that way, but also because they're getting hit in the head. So their brain, their neurology is getting affected each time they fight, but and ketones could potentially buffer a little bit of that neurological damage. Yeah, I'm really, really pleased that you brought that up. Actually, it's a real. Um pet project of mine to see if we can make this study happen um basically when you have an impact of the head short time after the you have a lot of um excitatory activity in your brain and then after that the brain has to re-equilibrate kind of re-equilibrate everything inside the brain it uses a lot of glucose and then after that there's a period where the brain is hypo glucose uh hypo able to metabolize glucose i'm not know whether i phrase that quite right but glucose metabolism is depressed and so this can last um three to four days after you've had a blow to the head and so in animal studies imaging they look at levels of atp inside the brain and they see that it's it's depressed um and so that's because glycolysis is being inhibited. So if you could provide the brain with another energy source like ketones at that time, then you could potentially uh, reduce the damage of not having enough energy in the brain for that three to four days after the head injury. So it's very difficult, again, to work out how to measure this because there's not very many good biomarkers of how severe a concussion is. You really have to do imaging. Uh, and that's uh, it's, it's difficult to get ethics to agree to subject someone to multiple like x-rays or imaging mm. protocols so it's it's not very easy to do i'm afraid i'm kind of looking for ideas on how to run that study and yeah. also you can't you can't get ethics to drop bricks on humans heads you have to get them as they come in uh with any kind of organic injuries like fighters and nfl players so it's, it's a difficult study to run yeah that again you with you being in the in the states um i remember reading recently how if something like 80% of NFL players when they've retired are, will exhibit some level of brain damage or a, a brain atrophy from all the head trauma that they had in the season. So, yeah, and, and the, the teams are becoming more and more liable for that as well. Yeah, so you, you would definitely have um, like uh, an ample supply of studies 
uh, uh, like subjects to study because they, I'm sure there must be so many guys who have l- different levels of concussion concussion per game that happens. Yeah, it's just getting a handle on measuring it. That's, yeah. It's really difficult to do. But um, we, we would love to run that study. And I think it's got the potential to be really transformative. Yeah, I'm uh, just thinking here, even rugby players. or So even if you've got your club amateurs out there who tend to get knocked about and because they're playing amateur level, they, they stay on the field longer than they should do maybe, to, even though they are concussed. Well, I think uh, the pros do that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can remember working with some rugby players and uh, you just knew they shouldn't be on the field. But um, even th- so even here, I'm thinking of application, potentially this is experimental, but you could take it to try and help your brain after the match too. Yes. So I think um, if, I, if I had some more data I, I, that was kind of confirming how I think it would work, um, I would say that if someone has a suspect, suspected concussion, that they should be taking three drinks a day for the three to four days after that concussion and that that would provide their brain with energy in a period where the brain would normally not have enough energy and then that would uh, maybe mitigate some of the long-term damages of concussion. But this is all hypothetical for yeah. me at the moment and, and based on animal research. There is good animal research showing that uh, either putting animals on a ketogenic diet or uh, infusing them with keto exogenous ketones has got some protective um effects if given before and afterwards it's just not been done in humans yet and it's difficult to do but i think um when you're talking about brain health it is kind of if it's not going to do any harm it may be worth a pun exactly and that's that's what i think about so if when it's it's always a risk benefit ratio and if if you're saying potentially i can take a ketone ester and there's no negative detrimental effect like i'm not going to get worse brain damage or other long-term health negative health change but potentially there's there's a positive to come out of this then why not you know just yeah. add it to the protocol and and hopefully because that's the time when your body's trying to heal so try and maximize that healing ability yeah i'm sure a lot of the players if you ask them would say that but i'm um, trying to get teams to pay for having you know pay invest in it when there's a limited data is kind of yeah. is more difficult so i think we, we do need data or yeah. people that are just passionate believers in, in the science. Yeah. I'm even thinking here outside of the application of athletes, you, you look the bigger the bigger <laughs> industry in this is just car accidents you know, or just yeah. accidents and people oh, getting totally. head traumas all the time. Totally. Yeah. Well, especially in the pediatric population, concussion is a really big problem. So, um, yeah, I think I'm c- completely with you. I think the sooner we can figure out how to answer this question, the sooner we can run the studies and, and work out whether or not this is going to be helpful or not. But I suspect that it will be, and I'm excited to see those studies be run yeah um is is there anything we haven't touched on about the the ketone ester that you think people should know about we talked about using it with carbs the recovery ability um side effects um not overdosing on it um not maybe taking every single day yeah Uh, i think the one thing that i'd like to highlight is that um, people should really look critically when they see studies of exogenous ketones so there's been a few come out since we last talked looking at ketone salts and then one other study that's come out that used a different ketone ester so i think that people often lump all exogenous ketones in together and assume that the effect should be the same if you take a ketone ester if you take a ketone salt or if you take a, a different ketone ester but that's not the case so um The two studies that have come out recently looking at ketone salts and performance have both showed that there was no effect of having ketone salts and performance. But a big reason why that might be is that the ketone levels with the ketone salt were much, much lower than with the ketone ester. So uh, and also they didn't give them with carbohydrates. So that's two very important things that weren't uh, done, let's say correctly, but weren't done in those studies that we believe is quite important to having a performance effect. So we think that you've got to get your ketone levels over three really and we also think that um you should take ketones with carbs so the two salt studies didn't didn't meet those two criteria the other the other thing to note is that there are different ketone ester compounds out there so i know this is probably going to be quite confusing for people because exogenous ketones are just new full stop Mm. um but the other ketone ester that's been studied recently is a ketone ester that has acetoacetate in it. And that's a very different compound. It behaves differently in the body to beta hydroxybutyrate, which is what is in the ester inside human ketone. And so rather than, you know, people can't assume that those two compounds are going to behave in the body in the same way as well. So the first difference to notice in, in the study uh, of this acetoacetate ester was, again, that the ketone level, blood BHB ketone levels were quite low, around about one millimolar again. So it's first very 
very big difference between that ketone ester and the BHB ketone ester, which is in human ketone. Um, and the other thing was that this ester hasn't been studied extensively in humans, and so they didn't know how to make it tolerable and a lot of athletes had uh, negative side effects so they reported vomiting and nausea and and that would have probably been quite a big uh, had a quite a big impact on their performance so um, I think people just need to really uh, separate exogenous ketones from endogenous ketosis firstly that's a a first big distinction to make that taking a ketone drink isn't the same as being on the diet but then if you're looking at exogenous ketones for performance and for, for health You've got to look at what ketone compound is being used. How high is it getting the ketone levels? Is it giving you beta-hydroxybutyrate or acetoacetate? Because these things are all important to understanding how it acts in the body. Um, for example, just as a, like another little aside, when you uh, raise acetoacetate in the blood, some of that is converted back into beta-hydroxybutyrate because it's in an equilibrium reaction. Beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate are very easily interconverted between one another. So if you take human ketone and a BHB ketone ester, you force that equilibrium to go from BHB to acetoacetate. As whereas for if you give lots of acetoacetate, some of it goes backwards into BHB and then back into acetoacetate. But when you convert acetoacetate into beta-hydroxybutyrate, like if you take an acetoacetate ester, then that uses up this cofactor inside the mitochondria that's called NADH. Um, and NADH is important for producing energy. So you're using up this thing, which is important to produce energy if you elevate acetoacetate. So energetically, it's not quite as favorable as giving beta-hydroxybutyrate. So this is just one subtle, very important but subtle reason as to why all ketone supplements aren't equal so people mm. need to not just lump all ketone supplements together and if they see a result where it's like oh the salt did this or didn't do this or the this ketone ester or that ketone ester did this or that you need to try and understand the biology of what's going on and not just bucket all exogenous ketones together i kind of feel like um with carbohydrates in sport, it took us a very long time to work out um, the optimal dosing, the optimal types of carbohydrates to give to, to really um, maximally potentiate athletic performance and when to give them and for what length of sport it's useful. And now we're even at the stage where we know that uh, a mouthwash with carbohydrate can be performance enhancing for short sports. But none of this was known when it first became kind of part of the sports science consciousness that carbs were useful. And I think it's the same with ketones. We're going to end up with a lot of subtlety around uh, uh, dose levels, compound, different compounds, like when to take them, how to take them, which sports they're good for. So I think this is a really exciting field and there's going to be a lot of subtlety to it. So rather than just being like, oh, well, this study came out and it contradicts what was seen in Oxford or this study came out and they've had a completely different finding. Let's kind of ha have a black box, put all of the evidence in the black box and just see what mounts up over time and not use any study result as a reason to kind of shut down the investigation. Cause I'm sure that there are going to be some things that are very, uh, very impacted by exogenous ketones. And there are going to be some things where exogenous ketones just aren't useful. Um, so I think that, that would be my, my kind of closing thought for everyone to take away and mull over and go back to the papers and have a little look and actually look at the data rather than just read the title and the abstract <laughs> mm. and that's as uh, if anyone who reads science papers unfortunately it's so easy to to get misinformed by just reading an abstract the the detail uh, is definitely in the in the paper itself and you ha and it's something as small as that where you said like what type of um, exogenous ketone did they use makes a big difference so they just use the general terminology but it was it's misinforming yeah so they in the title of the paper i think it was ketone ester impairs time trial performance and it's like well no actually this very specific ketone yeah. ester that also made people very sick and was also given in the doses that um so they use the same dosing uh that we gave in our oxford studies but it's a completely different compound so there's no you can't really compare the dosing of the two yeah. um if quite frankly um so you really need to read the paper to to know that, and also you know it's very it's very difficult to do, and I'm not you know not great at doing it myself. But you need to make time to do it, and and also then if you're, uh, I think people kind of go on social media and have a lot of opinions when they haven't read the papers properly. So make sure you read the paper if you're going to have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. So how can people order some of this uh, Esther if they want to get get it? Uh, so, so people need to go to human.com. Mm -hmm. And then go on the ketone product page there. You can check out our launch video and keep an eye out for me because I've got a cameo as, as the rower in our launch video. Okay, um, cool. And then there are options to buy. You can buy three, six or 12 
packs. Oh, I think actually the Reno 36 pack as well. Well, that's sort of like, that's a special Christmas treat for someone if, if you want to order 36. That's uh, a lot of dollars. Um, but yeah, go on our website. You can order it from there. Um, if people are struggling to get it shipped outside the US, we have on our help desk a few recommended um, what's called forwarding services because at the moment we don't ship outside the US. So you have to be a bit more creative if you want to order it outside the US. So do you do you know, because you're in the UK at the moment, would you think that the UK would have a problem importing it? Did they, would they classify the ester as something? Well, it's approved as a food, as I said earlier, approved as a food by the FDA. And so it's going to be packaged as a sports drink. Um, so the, any restrictions that apply to sports drinks would apply here. I, I'm not 100% sure. I guess we'll see when we start shipping if our mm. customers are having problems and try and feed that back and try and, you know, we, we are only allowed to sell it in the US. So unfortunately, people have to have to be a bit creative as well with okay. us. But we're hoping to expand. That's on the roadmap. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, maybe I'll try to figure out if, if I can get it across to the UK and uh, yeah. I'll, I'll let you, people know. Yeah, you let me know and then uh, we'll know the best loopholes for people to, to go for. <laughs> well, Brianna, I know you have to go, but I just want to say thank you so much again for sharing so many more knowledge bombs about ketones and exogenous ketones and uh, the little nuances people that need to know about because it, 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 it is detail that um, I think is, is very helpful for, for people to know. So I just want to say thank you again yeah. for sharing your info. No, no, it's been a pleasure to talk to you again, and I hope we have a chance to do it again soon as more, more research emerges. I'm happy to come back on again. Fantastic. Great. Thank you. Bye.